everybody. I'm out here at Prairie Wind Nursery. I'm with Bill Ferris. And Bill, you started this nursery 27 years ago, right? Go ahead and tell us a story of kind of how you started this and what you guys do here. Well, uh, thanks for coming out. Appreciate the opportunity. We uh, started uh, in 1990 however many years ago that was. And, uh, you know, our emphasis uh, growing here is on culinary herbs and uh, native plant materials. And then other plant materials that may or may not be native to Oklahoma, but that do well here. And, you know, we like to uh, uh, promote water conservation and uh, just making garden easier for the, the landscaper or the homeowner or just planting good, tough, vigorous, uh, you know, plants that'll do well here in Oklahoma's climate. Awesome, let's go take a look and see what all you're doing here. Good deal, come this way. All righty. You know, in here we've got, uh, this is a lettuce leaf basil, and it grows a really big kind of crinkly, looks like a big piece of lettuce, but I mean, it grows a leaf big enough that you can just lay it on your sandwich. And, and it's just and, $4 for this? Yeah. And people go to Home Depot and they spend $3 for something that's that big, and they could get this here. Yeah, and then this is a, a good variety. I mean, it does well here, and uh, it's just not that you know, well known. It's, it's, it's like a sweet basil or a, a Genovese basil, but it's just got this big leaf and, and gets it's a big bold plant with a good strong flavor. And so, of course, this is a mosquito plant here. So one thing I've heard about this, I've, I've read mixed things. What, since this, some of the stuff I've said is, is, is said that this um, is a geranium and does not actually work to repel mosquitoes because mosquito, the thing that works is the eucalyptus or whatever, the, 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 the lemon eucalyptus. There's, there's all sorts of, of uh, uh, information out there, pro and con. And, but I, what I've found is, is that anything, and it's not necessarily the scented geranium, but anything that has a really strong fragrance to it, because the mosquitoes hone in on, on your exhaled breath, the carbon dioxide. And I think that the strong, like lavenders and the basils and rosemaries, any of that sort of stuff, I think it, it's strong enough that it confuses their sense of, it's of a direction. Scent masking. It's the same way it works Basically. on the garden. Because exactly. It's scenting, you know, scent exactly. masking your plants that you're trying to protect. So. Exactly. And you yeah. know what? Uh, I found the same thing of people that want uh, deer repellent type plants, anything that has a real strong fragrance, your Mediterranean herbs, your sage, uh, lavender, rosemary, anything mm -hmm. like that, they won't bother. Uh, and as, I don't know if it will repel them, but they certainly won't eat it. Yeah. They may test it once or twice. And they'll and avoid they, the area because they, they might think it's all about it. Yeah. yeah. So if anything right. has a real strong uh, fragrance to it, they, they are kind of averse to. Is that catnip over here? That is catnip right there. And then there's a, this is a Greek columnar basil, but this this is what, when folks lose their regular cilantro because of the heat and it bolts and uh -huh. goes to seed, this is one of the options that they can go to. This is Vietnamese cilantro, or Rao Ram is what the, the Vietnamese call it. And you, they use it a lot in soups and fish dishes and all that, but it's not exactly a true cilantro mm -hmm. flavor, but it's very, very close. And I find that some people actually prefer this over regular cilantro. What it is think? very close. What do you think? Mild. Definitely has a cilantro you, flavor to it. You could definitely, if you want to make a salsa or have something that uh, substitute. And this is really hard to start from seed. No, well, because well, we, I, I tried to start it from seed. But it's easy to do from cuttings. Yeah, okay. And the, th and the hotter it gets, as long as it's got plenty of water, the hotter it gets, the more it goes. So mm -hmm. you, this stuff just goes crazy when it's hot and humid like this, because it's kind of, it really likes the moisture. Uh, so this is a, a very good economical replacement for your regular cilantro when it's too hot to grow that. Yeah, that's good. It's got a little bit of spice to it. The yeah, it's got a little little bit of a kick to it, but it's it's a good one. I mean, it's it's, yeah. it's you, generally you're putting it in something that's spicy anyway. It's also, so, uh, it's yeah. exactly. So it's it's real good. And then over here, is this, this the same as coolantro, or is that no, no? This is the coolantro. Okay. Here. This this is we call it Puerto Rican cilantro. It's come. Uh, it's native down in the Caribbean. It's an understory plant. It grows in the shade, so you need to remember that. This works great as a patio pot or something like that. Mm -hmm. Loves the heat, loves the humidity, but does not like our afternoon suns here. It's just too much for it to bear. But it's an also another good, and it's it actually has a really true cilantro Yeah, flavor. this is a lot more like cilantro, a lot and less the, uh, spicy. Uh, yeah. The folks down the Caribbean make a spice blend out of it called, they call Rical. I'm not sure what all is in it. There's other spices in it, but they use it uh, a lot like some people would use curry. But it's a really good, and tasty. This would be a great spot. So on on the west side of the house, no, as well. well I'm on the east side be, of the house. Yeah, the east, yeah, on the east side, side of the house. This, I have one, all my... this one will go anywhere. This will yes. take full sun as long as it's got the moisture. So and then you can 
So I've been growing yeah. this, but I haven't done anything with it. Yeah. Well, what would you do to prepare this? Well, it's hard for me to say because I'm one that doesn't particularly like curry, so yeah. I don't do anything with it except grow it and sell it to other folks for, for other folks. To so you're use. doing better than I do. I just grow it just to say I have a curry plant. I haven't right. figured out how to use but it yet. I've told you can use it in any any way that you would use regularly use curry, but it, it still has, it has that good true curry flavor to it. Yeah, we need to try some of this. I love the smell of it. I love having curry things. I just haven't learned how to make it yet. Yeah. Of course, here we've got various lavenders. We'll get out in, in a moment here and, and uh, take a look at our lavender trials out uh, outside. But we, we do about six or eight different uh, varieties of lavender. Which one's your favorite variety? Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, you know, I like uh, Munstead, uh, you know, if you want one of the shorter, kind of lower growing and, and spreading ones. But, mm -hmm. you know, if you want the blooms, probably. Uh, Harvest the, the stems, the Provence or Grasso are probably the, the better. They are uh, hybrid crosses. Uh, they are a lavender, not an English lavender, uh, but so they get their bigger, bolder plant and uh, have a longer, a lot longer stems. If you're looking for the cut flowers or the, just the blooms on them. But as far as growing them here in Oklahoma, it's about the same. There, I mean, the culture from aspect of it, you know, raised bed, sandy soil, well drained, uh, you know not too heavy on the water that's that, that's tricked all the mediterranean herbs whether it's rosemary or sage lavender oregano the, mm -hmm. you know, the lavender is probably the most sensitive to the watering you know when we get the monsoons here in the springtime it's just nothing you can do about it and what about in the winter how, how well does it typically do it, it, well uh we did fairly well you know there's several others participating in this trial that's going on right now and i think i'm the only i had the best success but we've really got an ideal spot here you know for the lavender because of the the drainage and the uh, south facing slope uh, and we had a little bit of dieback uh, but i think that's primarily it's not how cold it gets this winter was so erratic that we went from a very mild winter temperatures in the 60s almost 70s where these mediterranean herbs are really trying to grow yeah. to a few days later we were down to zero then we were back up in the 60s and then back down to zero and below yeah. zero and then back up and it's that yo-yo temperature is what really is hard on all, all of these uh, you know a lot of the broadleaf evergreens as well as the mediterranean herbs suffered because of that volatility in the, in the temperature yeah absolutely yeah and lemon balm folks that I like to make a little herb tea. That's uh, wow. You can dry those and, and put them in, in uh, and of course lemon. Uh, that's lemon verbena. This is lemon balm here. Uh, of course, you can do that the same way. You know, you take a squeeze of lemon and in into the jar, your jug, pitcher, whatever, and some uh, lemon balm and and uh, you know a little ice and have a real refreshing lemonade. Uh, here we're looking at oreganos. This is this is regular standard Greek oregano, which is you know most commonly called for by the, the chefs. Uh, that sweet marjoram there at the back, and then here we have a, Italian oregano, which is actually a cross between sweet marjoram and Greek oregano, and mm -hmm. it's somewhere in between. It's not as sweet as marjoram. It's not as as strong as uh, the Greek oregano, but it has a really nice mild oregano flavor to it. I have so many different tastes in my mouth, but I'll yeah. <laughs> clear the palate. And then on that side, this is a, an oregano called hot and spicy, mm -hmm. and it is just exactly what it's called. It is, it's Greek oregano that really has a kick to it. What do you think of that? Still red, oh yeah, there it comes in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of got an afterburner effect. It's like the pepper hot. No, mm -hmm. not the, yeah, yeah. But a lot of people really like it. Well, especially in some black beans or something, that would be really good. Mm -hmm. Of course, here we're getting into the, the rosemaries. Favorite. Yeah, we've got seven or eight different rosemaries. What's your favorite rosemary variety? Well, do you have one? I do. It's the Ferno. Uh, and uh, for a long time, I thought that that must be a, a French variety. Mm -hmm. And you come find out that it was named after uh, a plants lady uh, yeah. in, out of Dallas by the name of Lane Furneau. There's actually a Furneau Street in, in Dallas that was named after this, this lady who found it somewhere. I'm not mm -hmm. sure where the background of it, but it's, it's as, as hardy as art. And I think from an ornamental standpoint, it's uh, a little bit more attractive. It's got a tidier habit, a brighter green. Uh, the ARP is, is great, uh, and it has its own look. It's a little bit more of a rambling habit to it, spreading out. 
Uh, but it, the ARP is definitely, you know, the hardiest variety. And we can talk about that a little bit more if we get to the, to the, the rosemary trial trials over yeah, there. Absolutely. But uh, a lot of folks, this is, uh, this is barbecue. You can see it's a bright green leaf, very, very attractive looking. And this is great for uh, pot production if you want to just have a patio pot. It's not really hardy here, winter hardy, but people like it. It has big, long, straight, sturdy stems for, for barbecues, skewers, and that, hence the name. Um, this variety, this this is for no right here. Okay. It's got a really good fragrance to it. It's kind of mild. And one of the things yeah. that pe people ask me a lot is what, which is your favorite one to cook with? Mm -hmm. And that depends on your, your taste. What if you, you like the really strong uh, you know, rosemary flavor, I'd go with Arp. If you want something a little bit milder, Ferno or Salem, uh, is uh, they're not quite as, uh, as strong. To me, Arp is a little too strong because you take a bite of it, it'll water your eyes, you know, because it's, <laughs> it's that, that potent. But then we also have Grizzia here, which is this very columnar, upright growing uh, rosemary with a big, broad, thick leaf. And it has more of a floral, spicy, kind of flowery sort of fragrance and flavor to it that's this different than any you see what I'm talking mm -hmm. about? Yeah. It, it's so, you know, it's all personal preference when it comes to the taste. They're all good, which is what you whatever you prefer. You're at the point where you have the taste all memorized. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. can give you a rosemary to try mm -hmm. and you can tell me what variety it is. Well, I don't know if I'm that good <laughs> or not, but uh, I did like write a little uh, uh uh, a little kind of an info sheet on the various varieties of uh, rosemary that we do and the difference, the, the culinary differences and then also the, the landscape or, or aesthetic differences of them, you know, how they grow and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, the shape of the, the plant and that sort of thing. And uh, this is what you started with, right? When you started the nursery, it was rosemary was your favorite thing to grow, right? Well, it, it kind of came about that way. It wasn't when we started out. When we first started, we just, we didn't really know what we were going to do, we just knew we were going to grow, and then I had the opportunity to to grow a lot of uh, rosemary for commercial production. I was approached to uh, for some commercial operators that were out in Texas that needed planted large acreages. We did the cuttings for them because they wanted uh, you couldn't grow it from seed; it's too erratic and, and poor germination on it. So we were actually propagating cuttings that were then transplanted into the field for uh, for commercial production. Uh, we've got some bay laurel here. Anybody that likes uh I've never had bay laurel. Oh you gotta have bay laurel in your stew. Oh bay leaves, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is one thing we have not grown any of, so I well it's it's a slow crop, it is a tree, and it does it takes a while. And it's not you know, people do winter it over and grow it here outside, I'm told. I haven't actually seen that. I mean we've got some that are stock plants that are up in the other end of the greenhouse, you know, that are in uh seven to ten gallon pots that we you know we just leave them in the greenhouse and, and take cuttings off of those but uh, it's a very slow growing tree it's really easy to maintain in a pot you know on the patio or something mm -hmm. like that so that's really the, the best you bring way it inside in the winter yes and then bring it inside and then over here on the other side we've got mints uh, I don't know eight or ten different mints you know there's the basics we've got blue balsam peppermint <clears throat> we've got uh, the Kentucky Colonel Spearmint uh, for your mint juleps. We've got mojito mints for your mojitos. We've got lime mint, orange mint, uh, apple mint, pineapple mint, uh, candy mint, chocolate mint. So if you need mint, we can fix you up. We don't have every one of them, but we've got a lot of them. I love to take mint and put it in a jar. With so what I do is I take cucumbers and I, I slice them up and then I freeze them and and then I have little cucumber frozen ice blocks essentially. Yeah. I put that in water and throw mint in there with it too. Okay. It's cool. kind of my drink for the day. And right. I love yeah. to, to switch up all the different mints I use. I have a different flavor whenever I get bored with yeah. tired of a certain flavor. Sure. And this is, you probably use this. This is one of my favorite uh, Mexican herbs. It's Epizote. No, I've never heard of this either. Okay. How, how do you use it? Well, it's just, it's a spice that can be added to most any of your, your Mexican foods or southwestern New Mexico foods, but it's particularly good in beans. It's a good flavor for, for beans. Uh, if you this like, is the place to go if you want to buy cooking herbs, that's for yeah. sure. If you Everybody like the, ever wants here. the uh, cucumber flavor and, and uh, don't have any cucumbers on hand, if you've got lovage, you can substitute that. 
and this is a perennial. Yep. Like, so, you know, you just yeah. di just buy this one time, and you're you're good. Yep. You know, it's it's. Is this uh, hardy in the winter? Yeah, yeah, it sure is. Of course, uh, fennel and dill. Like Italian sausage, and then obviously pickles. But basil's we do. So, you know, it's our main herb crop. Look at the honeybee circling there, mm -hmm. working on that. The honeybees love the basils, especially the uh, African blue basil. Do you, do you pinch them off as you're starting them? No, generally not. I mean, I multi put multiple seeds in a in a pot, and we just direct so uh, on the. Of course, the African blue basil and the uh, Greek column are those are vegetative, so they have to be done with cuttings. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the regular, you know, sweet Genovese, uh, the purple basils, Thai basils, those are all lemon lime uh, done from seed. Now this one, this is the Genovese, you know, this is your typical pesto basil. You get some of this planted in the field so I start making pesto. One of the things that I want to experiment with is, is just taking each variety and making pesto with it and see what kind of variations that we can come up with and, mm -hmm. then, and then write down the recipes and, and make that you know, available to, to folks that are into pestos because there's there's more to it than just, you know, Genovese basil and pinion nuts and, uh, you know, olive oil. You can use, get a lot of the, I, I just think that pesto made with the, the lime basil mm -hmm. would be really good. It might not be, but but I'd love to try it and see, find out. A lot of people really, really like the, the licorice flavor in the Thai basil as well. Oh, I love Thai basil. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and then we've got cinnamon basil here. The thing about cinnamon basil is it's got these really strong, upright stems, and it makes a very good cut flower as well. So if you need a bouquet for your dinner table, you can use some, <laughs> some cinnamon basil. No, oh, this is beautiful. What is it? This is the bougainvillea. That's one of our specialties. We started out growing these when we, when we in the very beginning, and uh, been growing them now for about... Uh, 26 years. The uh, Carrie would love this. The thing with the bougainvillea is, you know, we get this question all the time. You know, people see my bougainvilleas, they say, Well, I bought this bougainvillea and it was beautiful when I bought it and it bloomed out and it finished and it's never bloomed again. And I have to get stuck with trying to explain to them what happens is that most bougainvilleas are grown in South Texas or Florida or someplace like that and they're shipped up here. The certain varieties are your most of them are day length sensitive. And so they're far enough south. They, the the bougainvilleas originally come from, from along the equator, Brazil, where they were first discovered by the French admirals, uh, botanists in 1768 or something like that. The French admiral's name was Bougainville, and that's why you have a, a South American vine that's named <laughs> after a, a Frenchman. But along the equator, the day length doesn't change much mm -hmm. so they're they are not affected you bring them this far north they quit blooming in the long days of summer what we've done over these many years that we've been growing is, is selected varieties that are not so sensitive that are day neutral and so we have a, six or eight different varieties that we grow here that will continue to bloom as you can see here we're at just past the july the fourth we're at july 8th 7th 8th whatever the day is and you know these are in full bloom and they should continue to bloom like that because they're not affected by that day length, which is what causes the, the normal bougainvillea to stop blooming during the summertime. So are, are these shade plants or? No, uh, these are full sun. Uh, of course, obviously the greenhouses are shaded a little bit to cut down on the heat right now, but uh, they need at least a half a day's full sun to, to bloom well. Um, but they'll tolerate all the heat you can give them. You know, out on the pool deck, concrete, patios, whatever, yeah. they'll, they'll tolerate it where nothing else will. And on this side, we've got times, all kinds of time. We've got uh, lawn time for, uh, you know, walking on or use it for uh, ground covers. And then we've got culinary times, uh, just ornamental times like the silver time, uh, lemon time. I remember you mentioning this one in your Uga presentation. What was it about this one you liked so much? Well, it's just, it's colorful. You know, yeah. you can put this thing in a, in a pot and it, it stands out, you know, where's the times, generally speaking, are just, you know, they're not that spectacular from an or ornamental standpoint, but the uh, the silver time will, will stand out because of the bright variegation on the on the uh, plants. And here we go, with French tarragon. I have so many different tastes in my mouth right now. <laughs> yeah. 
And this, but it's this, nice that we started off with the spicy. Yeah. And then we kind of kind of toned down, down a little bit. Oh, 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 we're yeah. with the basil. Mm -hmm. Now we're the thyme, mm -hmm. and it's right. kind of brought me back to normal. So yes. And uh, but this is true French tarragon, and quite often I have people say, you know, I got this this uh, tarragon and it has no flavor. That is grown from seed, it's Russian tarragon, and it's just, it's literally useless in a culinary. That is so good. Because it just I've never had this before. You never had tarragon? Mm -mm. Tell you what, you can take, there's a there's a chicken dish, I can get you the, the recipe to it, but you basically uh, take chicken breast, chunk it up, saute it, a little uh, oil and garlic, uh, you know, throw together a, a white sauce, and then as it's all at the end, everything's done, you want to toss everything together with a handful of torn up tarragon and about a handful of uh, green seedless grapes that you've quartered up mm -hmm. and just throw those all in a little bit of parsley and it's literally a 15 or 20 minute dish and it's just absolutely delicious. This tastes incredible and it gets better tasting the longer it's in my mouth. Right, right. Yes. I love and this. For folks that are trying to cut down on their sugar we've got stevia and you can... Uh, How much of it do you have to use? In a, so if you wanted to put this in a tea for example. Well. You're asking the wrong person because I don't drink tea, nor do I put sugar in it when I do drink tea. <laughs> but uh, to me, it's pretty potent. It is. Wow, that is sweet. But it, you can dry that and use it, or you know, you can just use it fresh. Wow. <laughs> don't eat two two leaves of that. It's overpowering. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not that much on. Uh, I gotta get some tarragon now. Get some tarragon. Wash down. it and wash it out. Gotta bring it about down to neutral. And then. We're back up to the to the sages now. This is white sage, Salvia apiana. This is native to the southwestern United States, and this is one of the Native American uh, ceremonial herbs that is used in, in, uh, to make smudge sticks and, and various things out of. Uh, it's not a culinary, uh, or release wise, I don't think that it is. Uh, it might taste a little rough, but there's pineapple sage, and then various ornamental sages that all have traditional sage flavor they would all work to make your sausage taste good but they're you know the variegated uh, golden variegated there and then the purple and the tricolor is the purple the, the, the flowers are purple that come from it okay. no well just the leaves just of the course, color. yeah you see how they, they kind of get the purple stems and, and the and cooler weather they're more colorful than they are in this heat of the summertime uh, this is a, a sage here that that uh, We've been growing for a number of years, and it's, it's a hybrid sage. We call it blue silver. We look at this out there in the trial garden. Just smell how fragrant, how potent that is. Wow. And it's also a great ornamental. It gets big. I mean, it gets three feet tall and blooms all summer, off and on all summer, but it's just really very fragrant, strong uh, flavor to it, if you like that much sage. I'd like to learn more about you know, what herbs go best with different things and different ways of cooking it. It's something that's an interest of mine. Yep. Do you have any books or anything on that topic that you like? Or you need to no, write one. Well, no, we, well, we need to get you to write a book on this. Maybe so. I, you know, I keep thinking I'm going to sit down and, and write up some, some recipes sometimes because I'm, you know, I, I'm not a chef. I'm not a trained cook, but I like to cook and, mm -hmm. and certainly like to cook with the culinary herbs. And, and I, I like easy, simple, easy stuff, you know, just like the chicken dish I was telling you about that you can yeah. throw together in 15 minutes because I'm like everyone else. I've got too many other things to do and I don't want to spend all afternoon you know in the kitchen but I do like to, to cook especially with the yeah, I would love to see your recipes for sure but this is my experience of growing and cooking all this mm. yeah and then of course right here we've got a few pet plants here here's your boot jalokia peppers for the folks that like the hot stuff we've got a good good pot crop going here ghost peppers oh it's a ghost pepper I'm not taking a bite out of them mm. no, me I, I don't even know why we exactly we have those here because I'm not eating them but uh, I've been cocky with peppers before and I've regretted it every time yeah well you know jalapeno is enough for me I don't know why anybody want to go beyond that yeah that's another story too many buffalo wild wings challenges in my previous life mm. <laughs> eating the hottest thing you can buy yes off the top of my head there's Arc, Ferno, Grizzia, Salem Hill Hardy and uh, and Tuscan Blue. That's, Got them. And so, but we, as you can see, there's a little bit of variation in some of them here. Some have struggled a little bit. We uh, had this trial going last fall, and with the extreme cold winter, we lost all but two plants, and they were both art plants that you can see there, right? The big art. 
uh, all the rest of them froze out. So we're trying it again here. We've had a little challenge here lately with the gopher. Anyway, we're going to continue on. You can see that we've got a little bit of, of thyme planted there, which was beautiful up until we had that about two week rainy spell back in the spring and then a little bit of it kind of browned out, but it's coming back. Uh, here is this salvia or sage that I was telling you about that we over in the, in the greenhouse there. And that's I love these flowers from these kind of between flushes right now. It's already had the first flush, but when it was blooming, the bees were just all over this. And this smells incredible. My daughters love to come up and just take a handful yeah. of it. And yeah, but you can tell by how sticky it is, how, how, how you know, the volatile oils, how full it is of, of the oils because it's got that sticky feeling to it. The same way with, with these rosemary. What do you use this for mostly, Sage? Sage, chicken it, and it's sauce. a flavoring mostly for sausage, but you know, a lot of things, you know, like your dressings and for Thanksgiving is, is generally what it's used for. It can be used for others, but uh, those traditionally, you know, making sausage and uh, Thanksgiving time uh, dressing is, uh, is the primary uses, I think, here in Oklahoma for sage anyway. But some of these, you can run your hand over some of these these uh, rosemary's and you feel, you feel it sticky. Yeah. That's, that's the volatile oils that are in this, this hot, humid, and, you know, they're growing vigorously. They're really cranking out the, the aroma fragrance right now. This is African blue basil. We just planted this out here to draw in the uh, pollinators. It's, uh, it just got planted right before the, the rains over the weekend, so it's looking a little weather beaten at the moment, but these will pick back up. These make huge plants, and uh, honeybees just love this stuff. Here's our lavender trial. We've got uh, seven different varieties out here. Uh, there's Hidcock, uh, Grosso, Gene Davis, which is kind of a dwarf pink variety, which I'm really impressed with. They're very big, but it's very seems very hardy and, and uh, uh, you know, vigorous out here. Uh, we've got uh, Munstead, Gene Davis, uh, Vera, and Alba behind me. But this is all uh, done in conjunction with uh, OSU Extension and the Kerr Foundation and uh, several other growers around the state to see, uh, you know, how much success we could have with uh, growing lavender here. You know, there's been lavender farms that have come and gone. I think that this will be successful. We hopefully we'll expand this out and have have uh, you know increase the size of it and maybe have our own lavender festival one of these days. It all started around the same time, or the different yes. times. No, well, initially it was all planted about this time last year. And then we did lose some through the winter and we lost some due to a gopher. So they, we've had some that have been replanted. Some were affected by the extreme cold more so than others. Which uh, variety is that? I mean, this one seems to be doing the best so far. Yes, this is Munstead, and that's right. It has done the best, you know, consistently, uh, with the exception of maybe Gene Davis. Gene Davis is not as big, but then again, it's more of a dwarf variety. And it's already bloomed uh, earlier, so, uh, you know, it did well. Uh, and then this is Provence. Provence has done very good. We did lose a couple of plants on it, but I, I'm not sure whether that was to the cold or to the gopher. Uh, so we need to, to work on our gopher prevention. This is the lavender alba. Of course, the blooms aren't quite open yet, but that's going to be white. Is it purple or is it? That's a white variety. The, the plants that survived look really good, but we had you know, significant loss through here. We, you know, basically half of them we, we, we lost, but it, it was really looking good coming into the winter. I mean, <clears throat> you never know. Of course, these plants weren't all that well established, having been planted, planted in the summer. They struggled to get through the summer. They picked up, looked really good in the fall. And of course, we had the mild winter with those extreme cold dips that, that really knocked everything back. So whenever you propagate lavender, rosemary, all these type of herbs, what, what's your method for doing it? It's, uh, it's cuttings, because you know all of these are named varieties, so in order to keep those genetics true, they have to be vegetatively propagated, and, and of course that means doing cuttings. Mm -hmm. uh, now with rosemary, you can layer it, you know, if, you, if you're a homeowner individual that, that wants to, you can uh, take a branch and lay it down onto the soil and maybe look, put a brick or concrete block on it, and it will root there, and then you can come back and, and separate that, cut that branch okay. off after it's rooted, dig it up and transplant it. But, you know, for commercial production, the consistency of it, it's all cuttings here. We use, uh, you know, our, our wintertime, we use our heated benches with the mist system, uh, which you have to be really careful with on, on lavender because it's just a little bit too moist, much moisture and they'll get the brown rot really quick. But we do use a, a commercial rooting hormone uh, to get them started. 
Uh, you found that makes a big difference? Oh yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of difference. Uh, but that's about the only way you can do it, you know, uh, and have consistent, you know, production. Yeah. Uh, there are some varieties of lavender and, and that you can grow from seed, but I find that they're they're generally not as vigorous and hardy as these named varieties are. Some of them make great pot crops and you know that sort of thing, florist type crops, but they're not yeah. not good hardy uh, lavenders for outdoor. Gotcha. This house is uh, primarily the our herbaceous perennials. We do an, have an emphasis on native plant materials here. Uh, this is a, a native allium or native onion. Uh, this is the, the nodding onion, uh, but that uh, right next to it is a native aster, aster oblongifolius. And then uh, here we have the prickly poppy there, the white flower. This is great. You look at that bumblebee oh, yeah. going for it. See there, the, the pollinators love that plant. If you're into uh, supporting pollinators, look at that. Look at that bumblebee going to town on that, getting that nectar. <clears throat> Well, and even if you even if you don't care anything about pollinators, you just think I want to grow food. That's kind of how I was when I started, and I and I had some issues, and I quickly learned that you need these guys around because what they're doing is they're pollinating your flowers for you. Well, for squash, for example, I had a lot of issues with squash that wasn't being pollinated right. right. Uh, I have twice as much squash this year as I had last year uh, for, from the same number of plants, just because. Uh, I have, I have more pollinators around. I have sure. catnip that's gone to flower that's brought in a ton of pollinators. You, I have sage you, that's gone to flower. And when you plant particularly the uh, Mediterranean herbs, the lavender, rosemary, oregano, sage, the European honeybees just flock to that in, in herds. I mean, it, it, it's amazing. Maybe we'll get to see it when we're out there, what they'll do with that sage. That, But uh, this plant right here is, is one of our native plants. This is a hummingbird. Uh, Agastache, hummingbird hyssop. Now the Agastaches are not native necessarily here to Oklahoma, but more to the north and, and west of here, but they grow great here. They just need uh, a well-drained soil, and uh, hummingbirds love these things as well as a lot of your, your pollinators. But we have, you know, several hundred varieties of native plant materials here. Uh, this one, did you see? This looks almost like a weed that I pulled. So now, that, should I not be pulling that? No, that's that's an aster. It's a native aster. It's called Aster uh, Lavius. It should be blooming here in a few more weeks. But uh, Amsonias. But this is another great plant here. This is a Colonestium uh, Gregi. This is a uh, uh, used to be in the Eupatorium. The botanist got a hold of the name of it. And, uh, changed category uh, classification on it but this is super important for your butterflies they love this nectar this is a plant that grows in part shade generally more of a moist moist area but if that's that's a native plant uh, the, these uh, are all perennials right oh yeah, 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 yeah so they'll come back perennials. year after year you buy them once put them in the ground yep yeah uh, are all these winter hardy as well yep you, bet. So you don't have to cover them necessarily no just... no because like with any plant here you're going to want to cut it back whatever dies back through the winter time some of these are more or less evergreen but you're always going to have a little bit of die back on them but this is one of my favorites here is this calalopus and you find this blooming in the springtime uh, up and down the bar ditches in the most horrible soil <laughs> horrible places and they just grow like crazy obviously uh, echinacea is one of the the favorites here in oklahoma because it's, it is uh, one of the most well-known uh, native plants here the purple, purple cone flower uh, this is the uh, a new seeded variety here, the uh, Cheyenne Spirit that has the, the pastel colors in here. You can see that this is a, an Echinacea purple rib, but we've got more than, than purple colors here. But uh, one of the things that I might want to say, when, when we kind of got into this line of, of plant materials is when we started out years ago, the idea was to just grow good, tough, hardy, vigorous plant materials that would not just survive but thrive here in Oklahoma's climate. Mm -hmm. Consequently, a lot of those were, were native plant materials, but it, there wasn't a lot of interest in the, in the native plant materials at the time, so we just didn't, didn't mention it. But in addition to that, you know, we've been went into a terrible drought there for a number of years, and I'm not sure that we're completely out of it yet, but water conservation is a big thing. So if you're using uh, the native plant materials in your landscape, you can cut way back on your water consumption. You don't have nearly nearly the water bill or the waste that you would with, with a lot of these other uh, plant materials. And then on top of that, these plants are adapted 
to our soils here. They'll, they'll grow here with we're helping them out or not. They were growing before uh, us Europeans got here in the first of thousands of years. So uh, they'll grow regardless of whether uh, we are gardening with them or not. So that that's the, the, kind of the main philosophy behind how we grow the native plant materials. Uh, here's a white echinacea. This is the powwow white. Do you use any of this stuff or anything besides just kind of uh, ornamental reasons? Uh, or well, is edible? I mean, using the teas or some like some are. I mean, for instance, uh, it's funny you should mention that uh, hibiscus. You know, hibiscus are, are uh, flowers are used to make uh, tea, and uh, the mallows are, are native. Uh, I mean, this is a hybrid version here, but uh, there is you know the uh, the Blue Creek variety that came from down in the Tishomingo, uh, you know, Blue Creek area. Uh, but they do very well here and you have these huge blooms all, all summer long and they thrive in this heat. You know, they're just now getting cranked up and going good because yeah. we're near 100 degrees. You know, on this side, uh, there's not a lot of bloom on these. This is the salvia greg eyes, the autumn sages, which are native to more the southwest of here, but they do very well here. Multiple varieties, there's white, uh, chiffon, red, uh, pink preference, apricot, coral. Uh, but these all do very well here, and as far as a flowering shrub, they're really hard to beat. They're one of the first things to bloom in the springtime. They will stall out a little bit in the peak of summer like where we're at right now, but then as we begin to cool off in the fall, they pick up again and bloom right into to frost. So they're, they're a great flowering shrub for this part of the state. I think so many people can be helped by this message because they, they want to have pretty flowers around their house. They go out to Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever, and they buy whatever's in front and then two months later it's dead because they plant hydrangea in full sun like I did. Well, and, and then, you know, we've all uh, kind of fell victim to the, the common wisdom is that you you have to improve the soils. You've got to add the amendments, the, the compost, uh, the fertilizer, the, you know, all of these things to amend the soils, uh, you know, and then you've got to add water and you've got to add for fertilizer. The biggest plank that I get uh, hear about native plant materials is, well, they get overgrown and weedy, and that's because we, we use conventional wisdom and we add too much water, too much fertility to the soil, and so they do overgrow themselves. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, if you want to cut back on these expenses, my whole idea is to make life simpler and easier. Uh, these, these plants will grow in the soil unamended, uh, you know, once established, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, without all of this extra work and inputs into to your landscape. We're trying to work on, you know, one of the, the difficulties is, is, you know, perennials for shade. Uh, this little batch, patch right here, the, the purple burgundy leaf and the green leaf, these are hookeras, uh, coral bells. Uh, you know, they're mainly a foliage plant. They do bloom. Uh, this one here is a big, uh, has tropical, big tropical foliage when it's in the landscape and it's starting to, to bloom now. It's, it's most hookeras bloom in the springtime. This one is autumn bride, it's white, but it blooms in the late summer. As you can see, it's starting to bud up there. But these make uh, very good you know, bedding plants for shady areas. And then, uh, of course, good old lambs here. The stockies here is not a native plant, but it does really good here, you know. That's a cool fill. Yes. Yeah, the I kids would like that, just to fill that. Well, you, you find a lot, a lot, lot of people You'll, they'll just want to pet it. <laughs> it's just that soft. My daughter would just marry, would yeah. just pet this. Yes, well, well a lot of people do. It's just, you, you're automatically drawn to it. But it's, it's a great plant for our climate here and our soils. We got her one of those little plastic playhouses, you know, for kids. And I took little flower pots all around it so she has her garden right, right there. So right. I need to put that in there for yeah. her. And she can... Yeah, there's, there's, there's some artemisias too that people want to do the same thing. They just want to pet them because they just they like fur. But uh, this is the Physostegia, the obedient plant. It's another native plant. That's right there. Of course, this is a hybrid uh, version here. But, uh, and then this has been cut back, but this is a tremendous native ground cover. This is frog fruit. We just cut that back so there's no blood. Anyway, he basically got out the blood test sheet and just checked every box on it, and then they went to test in my blood. And when it got to uh, Lyme disease, it was bingo. And so, but this, by this time, I was so sick, you know, I just, well, what am I going to do? And, uh, you know, I couldn't, couldn't work. I, I certainly couldn't deal with this heat in the summertime out here. Uh, so, <clears throat> to make a long story short, I went to a, a, a 
why I'm a literate doctor. I went through the Marshall Protocol, which is very controversial, but you know, it's, when you're in that condition, you'll do things you know that maybe you wouldn't ordinarily do, but it's a long-term antibiotic program, which basically after a year of taking uh, antibiotics, I think I'd whipped out the Lyme's disease, but my uh, digestive tract was destroyed. Yeah. So I was sick from that. I couldn't didn't feel like eating anything. So from that point, I was on my own. I just got onto the internet and started searching for, you know, this, that, and the other. And, and one day I was at the farmer's market, ran into an old friend of mine, uh, uh, the very uh, caring lady and, and uh, she asked me about the Lyme disease and I said well I think I've got that whipped I said but I've just I hurt so bad you know I, I feel like I've got arthritis and she says well you know I have a friend that uh, had uh, rheumatoid arthritis and she went on the, the gluten-free diet and said it really helped her I said well, I'll try anything so at this point I just got onto the internet found out what gluten-free meant and uh, you know I just initially in the beginning I just stopped eating bread and pasta well, within two days, I could tell a difference. And then uh, somebody later on, I was visiting with somebody, and I told them what had happened. And they said, oh, you need to go see uh, this particular nutritionist and see what, uh, you know, you find out if you got other food sensitivities. And so I went to, to this specialist, and I went on a kind of a baseline diet that consisted of just meat and leafy vegetables for six weeks. And then at, after that point, I started in adding one vegetable Per week mm -hmm. back into my diet till I could find out what I was sensitive to. Mm. Virtually uh, no sensitivity to vegetables and that sort of thing. What I'm sensitive to is preservatives and chemicals and that additives that are put into processed food. Mm -hmm. If it's natural, it's homegrown, fresh fruits, vegetables, I can eat anything I want to, meat, whatever. Uh, but if we're, I have problems is anytime something has, you know, things like uh, spicy stuff, uh, you know, artificial flavors like uh, smoke, you know, the, the liquid smoke, mm -hmm. uh, things like that, things that are heavily preserved, uh, they just tear me up. So I just eat, I don't eat it anymore. It's, amazing. it's pretty much the same story I, I had. I, mean, I went to kind of through, through the same process where I met Carrie and then I realized I had an issue with anxiety and depression. I found this book called The Depression Cure and it said there were like six basic things you can do to help with it and they were simple. It was drink more water, get more sunlight get more exercise, eat the right foods, specifically things like magnesium and calcium. And then probably the biggest thing for me was being more mindful. Um, I always have, I've, I've had a tendency to let my mind go places it shouldn't, uh, meaning into the future or into the past. Uh, I worry about things that might happen or I rummage about things that did happen. And now I keep them here and now, and I'm very deliberate about it. And I've gotta be because my mind wants to take me other places. But whenever I catch that happening, I find a daughter doing something cute and I focus on it and I bring it back to here, you know? Yeah. Or I, I go out to the garden, I worry about something here. And uh, and that's what got me into the garden to begin with, was I started, uh, we started trying to eat some of the things the book mentioned and we were spending $100 a week in a grocery bill. And I thought I should try growing some of this stuff. And then we started with those two gardens. And then it was the first time I tasted spinach out of the garden, it was a light bulb the moment for me. It yeah. was like, oh my gosh, I like the taste of this. Sure. I've never liked this in my life. And then two years later, our entire backyard's an urban food yeah. farm. So like, it, how can you not like homegrown tomatoes? Yeah, and now it's like, that's all we eat pretty much are things out of our garden or we try and, and we do chicken and beef and, and fish and stuff like that. Uh, and we'd like to get a better source of that. Right now we still go through the same ways we did before because it's expensive to buy you know, organic chicken and organic you beef know, and As I said, I was raised on a ranch and we always ate homegrown beef growing up. And my grandmother had chickens, so we had homegrown eggs and, and mm -hmm. home-raised, free-range chickens. But that was before the days of free-range, <laughs> they were just chickens then. Uh, but, uh, you know, we kind of got away from that as, as I moved on and life changed and all that. But you know, I'm back to raising my own beef, raising my own pork, uh, in the process of, of working on getting a, a chicken tractor so we can have our own chickens and, and, and you know, eating this chemical-free, uh, you know, unprocessed uh foods it's, it's the only way to go I mean, we've been led down you know a, a treacherous trail you know because i'm old enough to remember how it was you know when i was a kid growing up in the 60s you know before all of this you know corporate takeover and 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 all of this uh, preserved food you know you know i can remember when the first tv dinners and stuff came out it's like who could eat this stuff you know mm -hmm. and, and they finally got it improved to the point from, from a standpoint of flavor that people would eat this stuff but they did a lot of that by you know adding these these chemical preservatives and flavors that are not real food into this sort of thing. It tricks your brain into thinking it's good. Yeah. Like things like MSG trick your brain but into thinking this is good. Is, it's not. Most people, their opposition to this is, well, 
it takes too long or too much to prepare. And really, if you work at it, and it's what I've done, you know, I, I can throw together, you know, a pretty decent meal in just 10, 15 minutes and have something that's just, that's real and not, you know, out Using of all this, you just y yes. grab all this and throw it in. It makes yeah. it and, and, and you just got to change, get your mind out of the box. And, you know, you know, one of my favorite snacks is just, you know, I get, go to the, uh, healthy grocery store and I buy uh, the deli meat that's, that's not full of nitrates and all that, you just take that and uh, lay it on a piece of raw main lettuce and slap some cheese and mayonnaise on it and, and maybe, uh, you know, some tomatoes if you've got some or onion or celery stick, just roll it up and eat. That's my burrito. Yeah. You know, it mm -hmm. doesn't have to be wrapped in that linoleum-like piece of flour yeah. that, that's generally around a, a burrito. And you, you don't have to go to a fancy restaurant and pay $10 uh, to get it. You can yeah, or get 20 it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Like those restaurants charge so much for that kind of stuff, and we essentially just we have a, a a big burrito out of our garden, you know, almost every other day of just random stuff we just throw into there, yeah. and saute pretty much everything with onions yeah. and garlic and well, herbs. A, and you know, it, how long does it take to, to scramble a couple of eggs? You know, I can come in here and take a you know a can of diced chilies and uh, some mushrooms and, and some onions and saute them for just long enough for it to get hot. Throw two eggs in there and, and scramble those. And in four minutes, I've got a fine breakfast. Yeah. Know? And, and it's a whole lot better tasting than, than what you're going to get at the, at the fast food joint. Yeah. I'm glad we had this talk. Dude, you and I share a very well, lot I've, of similar I've, It's been amazing to how many people that I've run into that, you know, uh, with the same sorts of issues and, you know, that are celiac. Thank God I'm not that. You know, I'm just sensitive. I've just, uh, but folks that are, that have celiac disease and I have relatives that do, you know, uh, if there's anybody out there that, that, you know, has got had Lyme disease or has Lyme disease and, and wants to talk about it or, if there's anything I can do to advise or whatever, I'm more than happy to talk to them because it's a, it's a awful nasty Yeah, I had no disease. idea you dealt with those issues. And yeah. But I'll definitely it's, point it's, anyone it's your been, way. But. It's been 10 years now since I was, uh, you know, first started suffering. It was it's been 2009 when I was diagnosed, but it was a couple of years before Yeah, that. ticks are so bad right now. So I've, yeah. I've seen several people yeah, on I've had a couple on me. Had it. Yeah, I've already had, but, you know, I usually I feel them, but, you know, every once in a while I want to get latched down and I almost go into panic mode because I hate to deal with this again. All right, so we just finished up touring uh, Bill's place here at Prairie Wind Nursery, and I am overwhelmed with the amount of herbs he has. I mean, a lot of these things I've never seen, I've never tried. I got to go through and try pretty much everything he had here. I've got a really good idea of some, of some new ways to use this, especially the tarragon over here. I, I love this, so I'm going to pick some of that up and take it home with me as well. So, Bill, thanks for having us out here. Well, appreciate it. I Thank appreciate you. the tour. The native stuff he showed us was great. And uh, I really encourage people to come check out his nursery. If, if you're in Oklahoma, if you're not in Oklahoma, like he said, his website, www.prairiewindnursery.com. You can order any of the plants that you see here. And um, Bill, yes, yes. thanks again. Thanks for having us out. Thank you. I learned thanks so much uh, about everything well, that you showed hope us. Hope you'll so. come back. I will be back for sure. Thanks. Good deal. Thanks. What's up, everybody? I'm out here with Bill. Uh, Again. That's why it's weird that we're shooting the intro after we did it. I hate doing stuff like that. But... Okay, I'll try my best. Ready? What's up, everybody? I'm out here with Bill. I did it again. Why did...